Well, hello, can you introduce yourself? My name is Jay Van Bavel. I'm an Associate Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at New York University. And describe your sense of fashion. Is it eclectic, <laughs> classic, trendy, or random? Uh, it's probably random. <laughs> uh, my wife always tries to help me upgrade my sense of fashion, but um, it's always a work in progress. Maybe that's the best term for it. What's something that you're working on right now that you're excited about? I'm excited about this huge project I have right now where we're trying out um, uh, 10 different interventions to enhance support for climate change uh, around the world. And so we have about 80 people, 80 different countries and research teams in those countries. We're seeing what works best. Tell us about one of your favorite conference experiences. Um, my favorite conference experience was a small conference where um, we were all invited to the conference host's house. And there was only about like 10 to 15 people and no one was allowed to wear shoes. That was the one rule. And the other rule was they told us we had an hour, or 15 minute slot for our talk. So we all showed up for, with 15 minute talks. And then as soon as we got there, they told us we actually had an hour. And so it meant that we got to our slides really quickly and it turned into just a really fun conversation <laughs> instead of just filling the time that we all yeah, academics okay. do. So what's a downside of your job? Um, too much email, too many meetings. Um, those are kind of the things that you're always trying to like fight through to get to the stuff that you like. Tell us about one of your proudest achievements. Um, my proudest achievements? I wrote a book um, with m one of my old office mate, Dominic Packer, and we wrote it during COVID, and it was like a, uh, a bit of torture to try to do that while keeping our, our uh, mental lives together and our work lives together, but uh, we did it, and at the end, I was really proud of it. If you were finishing high school today, would you pick the same path that led you to where you are now? Oh, I mean, my path was winding. Um, I actually went to college to go to criminology. I applied my first two years and got rejected uh, when I tried to transfer in. And then I kind of stumbled into a social psychology class and, and fell in love with the topics and the ideas. And so I would definitely go back and do that. But I think I would be able to get to it much quicker uh, now that I know that I, that I like it instead of taking the winding path that I took. What's a favorite way for you to spend your free time? Um, I like to exercise. I like to uh, watch Seinfeld reruns with my kids. Um, I like to go hiking in the mountains whenever I can, uh, especially with my family. So I'm from Canada. We go back to uh, the Rocky Mountains and to Banff, and I really love that probably more than anything else. What's something that frustrates you about your field? Oh, um, I would say that there's a lack of nuance um, that People provide very simple explanations, and I think that's what gets rewarded, and people get rewarded for doubling down on their beliefs and theories. And so I wish there was more open-mindedness and complexity of thinking. What's something that you get very picky about, like a pet peeve? Pet peeve? Um, maybe the issue, I'll, I'll say my big pet peeve, not only in my work, but in society, is misinformation. I care a lot about accuracy and the truth, and people who spread you know, false conspiracy theories and fake news and misinformation are people who drive me mad. I think that's like a poison for society or for any organization or field. Name a song that describes your career so far. <laughs> oh man, um, I don't know. I feel like maybe the Beatles' "Long and Wi Long and Winding Road." <laughs> How about that? <laughs> that's a great. Do you have a book, a movie, or a TV show that you particularly recommend? Um. So I'll say one of my favorite movies was Silence of the Lambs. And the reason I went into criminology in undergrad was because I really wanted to be Clarice Starling and do uh, criminal profiling on serial killers and people like that. And so that still remains one of my favorite movies. Who's someone famous that you've met or saw? Um, I'll say about a block from where we're sitting right now. I came out of my office one day and saw John Bon Jovi uh, strolling down the street. <laughs> And I'm from, as I said, a small town in the middle of nowhere with no celebrities. And just seeing a celebrity to me is like uh, really funny and, and exciting. So did you, did you say hello? No, of course. I would never say hello to a celebrity. <laughs> it feels rude. There's also a New York thing where the celebrities actually don't have like these gilded mansions like in other wealth, wealthy places. So they're, they're walking around the city. And so there's kind of like an uh, unwritten rule that you don't talk to them. Oh. I'll say another good one. Um, Paul Rudd, who's like in the Avengers, he's Ant-Man. Um, his daughter was in my daughter's class at the local public school. And so I would go to like where our kids like read little stories in grade one or grade two, and he'd be sitting like three rows in front of me. And I always wanted to say hi, but I never had the nerve. And I, and I love Paul Rudd, I find him very funny. So, um, but that tells you how far I'll go not to say hi to somebody yeah. who's literally a parent of my daughter's friend. <laughs> so it's more like you don't talk to celebrities. Yeah. You bend over backwards not to. 
do you teach and what is it that you teach? Um, my main course is Introduction to Psychology, which I, I love. I teach it to about 300 to 350 people. And I love it because it's kind of like the greatest hits album of the field. And you get to teach all the great studies and all the big ideas. And it kind of blows people's mind who are learning it for the first time. Everything from perceptual illusions to the science of conformity. And uh, then I teach a, usually a grad seminar every year too. So that's usually with like 10 PhD or master's students. And it's kind of like diving deep into a topic. And I like that for a different reason. It's because you really get to like have deep discussions about the research and kind of what people think and in a very critical uh, and constructive and interesting way. So I, I love teaching those, even though they're radically opposite type of courses. And, I and I'm one of those professors who actually likes oh. teaching. Um, I, I know there's a lot of people who, who do not. <laughs> when you do that intro psych class, do you do all the lectures or is it just do one section of it? Or? Um, I do all the lectures, yeah. yeah, I teach the whole course. Although we have recitations and we have students lead the recitations. And the recitations are designed to be experiential. Like one week you have to go into the world and like challenge a social norm. Um, or you have to like play the fake news game, which was created by uh, Sandra Vander Linden in Cambridge, and like generate your own fake news and learn how people manipulate one another. So, and then come back and like describe your experience and what you learned. Who would you say is one of your role models? Um, we were just talking. One of my role models in science, one of my my heroes. I'll say two of them. Uh, one was John Cassiopo, and he was just a force of nature, one of the pioneers of the field of social neuroscience, which excited me because it brought together different fields in a really fresh and exciting ways and helped us realize there's a lot to learn from these other fields. Um, and I saw him give a colloquium my very first year of grad school and it just kind of changed how I thought about doing science. And then the other person I'll say that really kind of got me excited about social identity theory was Marilyn Brewer. And I ended up moving to Ohio State and she was uh, kind of a supporter and a mentor of mine for a number of years and I, and I really just fell in love with her ideas and, and just her as a person. She was also a force of nature in her own way. And so those two people really shaped how I think about the field. What was your first publication about? <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll say my first publication I was ever on was I was an undergrad and I collected data for, um, it was on social axioms, which are social beliefs. And it was with, I was one of 69 different authors. I think I was the 18th author. And I collected the data in Canada and it was comparing people in different cultures and this different uh, social beliefs they had that they took for granted. Um, and then my first real paper where I was the first author uh, was uh, the very first study I did with my PhD advisor, Will Cunningham. And what we did was we used social identity theory to change racial bias. And so we assigned people to minimal groups where by basically by a flip of a coin, they're part of a group, but their own group was mixed in race. So half white and half black. And we suddenly saw participants who are mostly white um, suddenly showed no bias towards anybody who was a member of their team. And, and this was true whether we used kind of implicit measures of their automatic reactions or fMRI. And so it allowed me kind of a way of thinking about the human mind as one that is really attuned to the groups we belong to right now. And that, that can be so powerful, at least in the moment, it can override how we think of other people that we can bring them into our group psychologically. What's a bit of advice you might have for living a good life? Um, I would say uh, social connection. The lesson from social psychology is that if we have good relationships with people we care about, it affects our mental well-being, our physical health. And so I'd say embrace your friendships, your relationships with people, and try to uh, remember that those are probably the most important thing in your life. What's your favorite city in the world? Um, I'm in New York City, and I'd say I've become a New Yorker at heart. <laughs> um, of course, becoming a New Yorker means that you have to embrace the best of it and the worst of it, and there's definitely both. Um, if I was traveling somewhere, I would say maybe one of the most beautiful places I've been is Barcelona. It's right mm -hmm. on the ocean, great weather, Spanish food. Uh, so that would be the place if I probably could pick to retire, that would be where I'd go. What was a course you took as an undergraduate that was especially enjoyable or memorable? I would say maybe my introduction to social psychology course was a real career turner for me. I just found it so interesting and got excited about the topics and realized you could use science to understand the things that were happening in the world that I cared about. And what do you hope to be doing 10 years from now? Oh man, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I think my goal as I get older is to think about ways to make an impact in the world more and more, um, get out of the lab a little bit more, do research on things that I think matter in the world. And so I think I can imagine seeing myself doing the same basic job, which I love, doing science, teaching, um, but finding ways to do it in it, research that's more impactful and less of the traditional kind of lab experiments I used to do. 
Well, thank you very much, Jay. Appreciate this. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Yeah.